still strong. Belmont is all that. Our conference champions, baby, let's go! A walk-off home run over the left field wall. It's Lily Hallam winning the women's 800. Hello, Bruin Nation. My name is Cam Fish, and you might recognize me from last week's podcast where I was a guest, but not this time. You can't get rid of me that fast. I am so excited to host this week's Belmont Bruin Show. We have some fun things planned with guests that I think y'all will really enjoy. But before we do that, I want to introduce myself a little bit more. I'm a junior communications major, sports administration minor from Panama City Beach, Florida. I'm on the golf team here at Belmont and I have had the best three years. I honestly cannot say enough great things about Belmont. I am a music fanatic. I grew up in a home filled with music always playing. My dad's a musician and has taught me so much about the world of music and that there's truly never a bad time to break out into song. And if you know me, you know that I will break out into song probably 80% of our conversations, but no shame here. I love all different types of music. And when I say that, I really mean it. I can go from anywhere from country to the Bee Gees to musicals, indie pop, and then all the way back to hymns. I love a good hymn. Um, a fairly recent new hobby of mine is writing. It's really been a unique way for me to express my thoughts. And it, this tool has uh, helped me connect better with others. I've loved film and video editing, production, creative media, and these are things that catapulted me into a love for sports production and sports storytelling. And last but not least, um, I'm a Christian. God and the church has always been a big part of my life and an important aspect about who I am as a person. I accepted Jesus into my heart when I was nine years old, and it's been the best decision I've ever made. I've grown closer to the Lord, especially through quarantine and the adversity that this year has brought. The Lord has shown me so much grace and faithfulness throughout my life. And especially in crazy times like these, he gives me peace. But hey, that's enough about me. I am really excited to bring on these three guests and to learn more about them. And while I learn about them too, let's ask all the burning questions that I know you guys have been wanting to know. So. We all know John Langdon, but today we are going to dig a little deeper and maybe learn some new things about this on-campus legend that you might not have known. So, John, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me, Cam. Joy glad to be here. Great. John, I remember the first time I met you. It was actually at the Ohio Valley Conference Championship before I was even a freshman at Belmont. That's right. I remember that. Yeah. I was on, on the... Was it a real round or was it a practice round? I can't remember. Uh, but I remember you coming up with your dad uh, to come watch us play. It was really, it was great to, uh, to meet you up there, so. Yeah, well, you have been such a great helper to me and friend, not just to me, but to so many others on Belmont's campus. So thank you for that. Well, it's a pleasure. John, like to, I, it's, a, it's a pleasure to work here. I've been here a long time and I, I really enjoy the people I work with and all the student athletes that I get to work with too, so. That's awesome. Like I said, you're nothing short of a legend at Belmont. So tell us the story about how you came to Belmont and how you became a Bruin for life. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I came here in the summer of 1998. Uh, I was hired to be um, by the old, our former athletic director, Mike Strickland. And uh, I've had, um, since that time, since I started, I've been in like five or six different roles, probably more than that. Uh, in my time here, I've done media relations, I've done tickets, I've done operations, I've done um, I, what I'm doing now, which is compliance and I do student athlete development. So I've had, uh, it, my nickname in the office is John of all trades because I, I have a lot of experience and I've done a lot <laughs> of different things here. So um, it's um, it's been a blessing to be here and um, it's, it's just a great place to work. And um, I'm, and, so I've so I've I've been in the compliance role since about 2007. So um, and I just started the student athlete development piece uh, about two years ago. So. Well, we've loved getting to know you, all of the students, and I really got to tell you, I'm kind of coming for your job one day, maybe. So <laughs> you might have to <laughs> you might have to watch out, or else I'll be in that office with all you guys. I know that that office used to always be bumping, so I know that we miss seeing all of those faces every day. 
Um, I know that you just said that you're the student, kind of like a student helper and work with us. Um, so how much travel do you cover for Belmont Athletics, um, whether it go like sport to sport or how much do you do? That? I don't, I, I do, I do some travel, like I'll travel, uh, Sometimes we watch the golf teams. That's who I work with within the media relations role that I have. But I enjoy watching us play on the road. So um, I go to uh, if if a, if a match is close by, um, I try to get to it either a basketball game or golf or or soccer or volleyball. If, it, if it's close by, I, I try to um, uh, check out the Bruins. Um, sometimes I'll, you know we go to conference championships and that sort of thing. Uh, but for the most part, if it's if it's around the general area, which is great because of all the OVC, we're in being in the OVC and a lot of the schools are nearby. I love going over and watching us play um, in, in the in those venues as well as here at the Curb Center and over at Rose Park. So that's awesome. And you do a lot of travel outside of your job as well. I know that we see all of your postings, which is so fun. <laughs> What's one of the your favorite places that you've been outside of your career? Um, I would say I, I love going to England. Uh, it's one of my favorite places. Uh, I, I was just there last um, uh, in in I guess April and May of 2019, and I just we I love going to London, and I, I've I've been a big fan of English history. I was a history major in college, so um, just to kind of visit there is just, uh, it's always a thrill to be there. So it, I, I've been to England, I think mm -hmm. three times, maybe four times. So it's it's just one of my favorite places to go to. So um, I've been to a lot of places and I've been very lucky to get to go to a lot of different places in this world and um, especially in, mm -hmm. in Europe and Australia. So, but I thought England's probably my, my top place probably, so. Those are awesome places. I've still never been out of the country. So I definitely envy you. And whenever you post new places you've been, I'm like, oh, I wish I was there with you. And well, that's, that's that the tough stuff. thing about that's the tough thing about the pandemic is we were uh, I was supposed to go to a couple places uh, this year and it, it didn't work out. But you know, it'll hopefully we'll have a chance to go next year or the year after. So, but it, uh, yeah, I, I miss I miss not going overseas this this year. I, it, mm -hmm. you know, I, it was it was I always enjoy it. So, yeah. So once this pandemic is over, where do you think your first place you want to visit is? <laughs> Um, we, uh, I, I travel a lot with my mom. My dad doesn't like to fly anymore uh, and doesn't mm -hmm. like to. And so we have plans to go to Portugal next summer. Um, uh, hopefully that will happen. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're supposed to go on a Mediterranean cruise, which I've never been on a Mediterranean cruise. We're supposed to do that in a oh. couple of years. So, um, so yeah, Portugal, I've only been to once uh, briefly. So I'm looking for, I've heard really good things. Uh, the basketball team went there last summer. So mm -hmm. I mean, two summers ago, so I, I've heard really good things. So I'm looking forward to going back, going to Portugal and seeing it, so. Man, that's de definitely something to look forward to after all this mm -hmm. is over, yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's still plenty of places. There's still plenty of places in this country that I, I'd like to go see out West. I love going to mountains and national parks and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. so there's still some places out West that I'd love to visit sometime soon as well, so. For sure, that's awesome. Um, so throughout the pandemic, has there been any certain hobby you picked up? What have you done that's been sort of like you're saying over those five, six months that we weren't at school or that you weren't working? Uh, I played a lot of golf. Um, there for a while here in town, uh, the public courses were free. So um, I spent a lot of time um, playing golf, um, just checking out, just, just walking on the course. So I, that's probably the one thing I've done the most is, is the golf. I've done a lot of golf, so. Oh, and has with. your, I, you're right, I am. Has your scores improved through your persistent practicing and playing? Well, it was like, I think it was getting better early in the summer, but as the, as we came back to work, uh, I didn't have as much time to play. So my, my golf uh, game kind of uh, dropped off a little bit, but um, <laughs> it was just great to be outside and um, just to kind of, because all of us were stuck inside for so long and really couldn't go anywhere and being outside in the park was one place that you could easily go and you know and, and so it was just great to get some fresh air and see the sun and, and not have mm -hmm. to be stuck inside a house I mean your condo or house trying to figure out what's you know what to do next so I, I cleaned my, totally I cleaned my house my I mean I had I thoroughly cleaned my house the first few weeks the first month or two I pretty much did everything I was supposed to. Then I ran out of stuff to do around the house. And then I started playing golf, so. 
I feel that. I mean, I don't know about the cleaning my house part. My room <laughs> still stayed pretty messy throughout the pandemic, I have to be honest with you. But I feel the same way. I was really thankful that golf courses in Florida stayed mm-hmm. essential because, I mean, thank goodness I like golf and, and fairly mm-hmm. good at it where I can play it, you know, every day. And that's a good, what, five hours mm-hmm. that I'm not wasting, but that I'm getting out of my what seem to be super long days, you know? So that's really awesome. Well, I hope that, you know, you get to play some more and maybe maybe the next time I ask about your golf scores, it can be maybe a little bit more positive, <laughs> but I'm glad to know that you were playing some. That's awesome. So throughout your time at Belmont, like you said, you've been here for a while. What has been one of the most like amazing, whether it be games that you've witnessed or moments that you've witnessed, what has been one of the most like impactful and cool moments of your Belmont athletics time at Belmont? Hard question. If you I had feel... to pick one. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Well, I, this is good. Cause I, I make this, I make other sound at, at entry questions like this. So it's good to turn it <laughs> yeah. off as fair play. So um, I would say, honestly, the, the moment that really sticks out to me that um, was in 2006, I was in Johnson City when the men's basketball team beat Lipscomb to go to the NCAA tournament for the first time. And they were the first team, uh, first Belmont team to qualify for the NCAA tournament. Um, and I think as one who had been here, like when I first started at Belmont was the first year that we were full division one member. And so we weren't, mm-hmm. we were in a conference, we were independent for the first a couple of years, the first two, three years I was here. So I think that moment of like, we we made it, like we made the tournament and like, we kind of stepped out onto the national stage. I think for me, that was the moment where it, like, um, it kind of like verified everything we had worked, all of us in the department had worked for to get to that point. And so um, it was a crazy game. We almost could have lost, especially losing the Lipscomb would have been like heartbreaking. But um, mm-hmm. I, I would say that's the moment that kind of sticks out to me where it just, it, it really, validated what we were doing um, in terms of division one and it, you know, winning that championship was just huge for the program. And it, I think it, it propelled us to not only basketball, but all of our other sports ahead and that, you know, that we could be successful at this level. So. Absolutely. And I feel like we've proved ourselves ever since that mm-hmm. time. So yeah. that is awesome that you got to witness that and kind of saw how Belmont athletics has just progressed and became into a awesome division one school for sports that's really yeah, cool plus it, plus it was nerve-wracking it was probably the most nerve-wracking <laughs> game i've been to mainly because it was lipscomb because i mean at that point um you know they had just joined a bit we were both kind of fighting you know for the, to be that first team you know we had been rivals for a long time and to be that first team to make the tournament so it was i think it was that height that heightened the uh uh, everything about it and so it, it, it was a, it was a great moment it was just an awesome moment so that's so cool I know every basketball game I watch specifically for Belmont I think because I pull so hard for them I am always just on the edge of my seat mm-hmm. like I don't know even if it's just the easiest team that we're playing against like it were a shoe and I'm always just like you know, you make, make the basket. I'm really bad at that terminology, so <laughs> excuse me. But I am always just, I feel like I've just gotten so much more involved with other sports since I've came here. You know, before it was just so much golf and, and mm-hmm. I never really had a reason to get involved in any other sports. And now I find myself supporting, you know, the soccer teams so much and the softball teams and the basketball teams. So being in your position, I bet that you just not feel overwhelmed, but there's so many people you could pull for, you know, oh, yeah, and that's... it can get, it can get, you know, overwhelming or it can get hard to keep up with sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's the great part is you get to cheer on these people that you know really well, like you've gotten to know while their time here. And, and it's great when they're, when they win and they're successful, um, you feel like you have a little bit of a little piece of that, of that, you know, the, of that success that they have is maybe you had a mm-hmm. little bit to do with it. You know, they had the most mm-hmm. to do with it, but it is just, it makes you feel good about cheering because you know who they are. I mean, that's the thing. It's the great about cheering, working at college is you get to cheer on the people that you see every day. And so that's, mm-hmm. and it's, it's great when they're successful and then when they win. Yeah. So I love that. And I think I can speak for some of the athletes too, whenever we play good, you know, it's nice to make the people that we do the work for 
and play for, you know, feel proud of us and feel so happy that we play well and just all of y'all's support uh, means so much mm-hmm. to us. And it really just keeps us going, you know? Um, mm-hmm. So outside of Belmont, what are some of your favorite sports teams? Who do you pull for? I know probably Titans. I don't know. Tell us who some of your favorite all-time sports teams are. Uh, I, I, I am a Titans fan, and I'm, I, I cheer for the local team, so the Titans and the Predators. Um, um, I, I've, I've been a lifelong Cardinal fan, St. Louis Cardinals fan, so that's probably my baseball team that I cheer for. And then, you know, growing up here in town, um, and I didn't have a connection to Belmont. I was I was always a big Vanderbilt fan, a, a long suffering Vanderbilt fan. So um, mm. so I grew up going to the baseball and football and basketball games. So um, so that's those are probably the teams that I cheer for the most um, around here. Just the, the local teams. So yeah, but I love sports across the board. I mean, I love watching sports on television. It's great. So no matter who the teams yeah. are. So. That's awesome. I don't think I've ever asked you this question or know the answer, but what is your favorite sport? Do you have one? Oh, that's too hard. Um, oh, come on. Want, you know, I'd probably say it's a tie, but it's probably between football and basketball. Like, uh, especially, I would probably say more football than um, just, I enjoy like college football and the NFL. I, I enjoy watching those, uh, those games on the weekends. So, um, but basketball is up there too. I love watching Belmont basketball and uh, when it's on mm-hmm. TV, I'll, I'll watch, but I would probably say football mm-hmm. is my favorite sport. So. Okay. Did you play football at all growing up or? I did not. The only sport I played was golf in high school and I was not very good at really? that. So yeah. So. <laughs> oh no. Come on. I bet you were a little better than, are you I better was, than I, you are now or? Uh, um, I think I was probably a little better then than I am now. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, hey, we we gotta you know break that record or whatever. What's your lowest score? If you want to say, you don't have to say. I think, but I think my lowest is, score I ever shot it. was a, on nine holes. I probably shot a thirty-seven, <laughs> probably. So. Hey, that's great. Yeah. I would I would kill to shoot a thirty-seven some days. So that's awesome. Well, one we'll have to, to break bar one, one day. Yeah, and one day I'd love to have a hole in one. That'd be the other one that I'd like to, love to have at some point. So. I still don't have a hole in one either. I am right there with you. It's getting me. Every time I'm on a Perth par three, I just say to myself, this is it. This is going in. But you know what? It hasn't gone in yet. So <laughs> you think I should change like my mindset or something? I mean, something's not working, obviously. It's not clicking up here. I think it's, just, I, I, don't, I don't ever think about it anymore on par three. I, I just want to be surprised when it happens. It'll, it'll be great. You know? <laughs> that is a really good mindset to have. I feel like now I'm just like expecting something amazing, but I like your mindset. I think I'm going to have to change it to that. Well, I have one last question and it's, okay. you have so many amazing pictures and Photoshop pictures outside of your window. <laughs> I think that a lot of us have seen them uh, just walking by. And I have to say like some of your Christmas cards are pretty interesting. The graphics are amazing and different so what I mean does something inspire your Christmas cards are is there some background to that because I know there was a um, correct me if I'm wrong there was a koala one year that was just plastered (laughs) everywhere I think I see see that picture before I sleep every night tell me about that (laughs) Uh, the Christmas card is actually just a result of like Sam's or Costco so that's uh, that's the uh there's no there's no uh there's no there's no fantasy fancy stuff with that but I try to put a picture up of if I had gone somewhere that year, I always try to like put a picture up of me and, and those places. So, mm-hmm. um, and yes, there is a, ko- a famous koala picture. Yeah. When I was in, in uh, Australia, I did get a picture made with the koala bear, Kiki, the koala bear. So uh, <laughs> Kiki, I love it. It was I the best, it. it was the best $20 I ever spent. So, um, but uh, totally so, worth it, right? Oh, it's totally worth it. Yes. Yeah. So that is a, it's a legendary picture in the office. Yes. Um, It's amazing. It makes me smile. And I think everybody (laughs) smile every time they see it. So I am so thankful I was around to see that picture, (laughs) honestly. So John, thank you again for your smile and your unwavering support for all athletes at Belmont. It's my pleasure. And thanks for having me on your show uh, uh, today, Cam. I've had, I've had a blast. It's always fun talking to you. 
After the break, we are going to meet with Emily Proud and learn more about the Athletic Mentorship Program. Our next guest is a Belmont women's soccer alum, and you've probably seen her on Nashville's local station telling you about your favorite sports team. Emily Proud, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yay. Emily and I have recently gotten to know each other through the Belmont Athlete Mentoring Program. This program is built to initiate and develop relationships between student athletes and professionals from industries all around the Nashville area. Each athlete is given a mentor in their aspiring career path to help them sort of mold and create a good idea of what they want to do and be in the future. These connections that we make through the program can help guide and direct us in our personal goals, career developments, net networking, and hopefully future opportunities. And as well as they just give us advice as a young collegiate athlete aspiring to have some sort of plan after graduation. So Emily, I know that you're just as new to this program as I am, but what does it feel like to be a mentor? It feels weird. Uh, <laughs> I don't feel qualified necessarily for that. Um, but I think, I think what both you and I learned in, in our first uh, little Zoom call that we did was that we're both very similar um, in the way that, you know, personality wise, career goal wise, um, we both realized that we're very type A um, and we see the world in, in very similar ways. And so that was really cool. I felt like I was talking to my old, uh, old college self. So it, it's really cool. And it honestly helps me a ton to, um, to look back at my career and, and to think about it. And um, when I'm giving you advice, I'm reminding myself of advice that I'm tra mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to also mm -hmm. um, take note of. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really cool. I'm enjoying it so far. Yeah, well, me too. Our conversations that we've had so far have been really insightful and helpful, and I'm really thankful for this program. Um, like I said, you're an alum from Belmont. So tell us a little bit about what Belmont was like when you're here, when you were here. A lot of really big holes. Um, there was a lot of blasting going on because they were building <laughs> all these new buildings. Um, yeah, but in, in general... Yeah, no, it doesn't seem like it's really changed all that much. Um, but no, it, it was cool. It was just kind of like the spunky little school that could and to see um, it be on a national stage last week with a debate and uh, just had a World Series champion come from Belmont. I mean, that is so cool. And right, just to see yeah. how much everything has, has grown so much. I'm so proud to be uh, a Belmont alum. But back then it was it was a little different. I mean, really, really not that long ago. So I'm sure yeah, you know that no, yeah. not a whole lot has changed. I'm very mm -hmm. jealous of where the whole journalism setup is. I wish that I mm -hmm. had that opportunity mm -hmm. to be in the studio um, that mm -hmm. you guys have. It, it looks so cool. But I love the fact mm -hmm. that they continue to grow these programs and um, to continue to give back to students and not just say, well, work with what you got. Um, they're, they're always mm -hmm. growing and mm -hmm. it's, it's going to pay off. Yeah, that's awesome. You were also on the soccer team. So how did you get into soccer and why Belmont? So I grew up playing soccer from when I could, you know, first start, maybe like six. Um, and I was one of those people, I'm the same way now where I'm so interested in a bunch of other sports that I tried basically every single one. Mm -hmm. um, but it would always end the same way is oh, I can't do this because I have soccer practice. And so it always put soccer um, as the number one precedent. And it was just such a fun sport in the way that, you know, it's a team sport. So I made lifelong friends that I still keep in touch with um, to this day that I've played with since I was half the size that I am now. And so just mm -hmm. all the, the cool connections that I've made, um, it's really opened up the world too. I mean, being able to go on recruiting trips and, and being able to go um, to different places across the country on tournaments. I spent almost every New Year's at Disney World in a soccer tournament, which as a young kid, that's the greatest place on earth. Um, and so <laughs> that was really awesome. And then as far as finding Belmont, um, I actually was about to, you know, give up on my soccer career because I was one of those rare people that knew exactly what you wanted to do. Um, I wanted to be a sports feature writer, which is not what I'm doing now. So I thought that because um, I wanted to do that, that, 
you know, I couldn't let sports stand in my way. Um, but I have an older sister who played soccer at Samford University. And hmm. she just showed me how much fun it was and how you show up at school already with a group of best friends uh, and mm. how much easier that made her transition. And so last minute, I was the last one in my class. I was a walk on. I just was like, I got it. I got to wow. have some soccer in my life. Um, and I'm so glad that I did. That's awesome. So now from playing soccer and from playing all of these sports, you're reporting them. Tell us a little bit about your current career path. Yeah, so right now, um, as you said, I'm working here locally in Nashville at News 2. Uh, I was an intern back when I was at Belmont News 2, so it's kind of all come full circle. Uh, my first job out of school was back in Knoxville, which is my hometown, so I don't get out much other than this half of the state of Tennessee, <laughs> but I love it, so why else would I go anywhere? Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's it's been wonderful. I mean, the, the cool part about local news is that you get to do basically everything, and so it's something that I would definitely recommend um, to somebody that, that's young and learning because you never know if there's one aspect of this job that maybe you want to create and be your niche. Um, you get to learn everything, whether you want to or not. You got to do everything. You got to pick up a mm -hmm. camera. You got to produce. You got to write. You got to edit. Mm -hmm. You got to shoot. You got to do everything. Um, but then you might find out, you know what? I really like producing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep mm -hmm. producing um, and then maybe go down that path. And so I love how everything um, is, is on the table. And I'm really enjoying covering a bunch of different sports too. That's a cool part about Nashville mm -hmm. is we have so many different things and now people are trying to get major league baseball here. And so it just continues to grow. <laughs> um, and there's, there's never a dull moment in Nashville. Oh, I would completely agree with that. And it's such a great place to cover any sort of sport because like you said, there's so many new opportunities and it feels like a new team every two years is popping up around here. So definitely and good teams to too. Up. I've covered a yeah. Stanley Cup final, AFC championship game. I mean, there's been some good sports action here too, which always is fun from, from a coverage standpoint. Right. Actually, well, it's nice to report, you know, good reporting. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So you mentioned that there wasn't really um, a lot for you to get involved with at Belmont at the time for your current um, job. So what did you do? Like, what did you do during um, your college career to try and get you where you are now? Like, where did you, did you branch out? How did you do that? And what like advice can you give to other students who don't really have opportunities at their college to do something that they want to do after college? Yeah, the cool part about Belmont is there's so much opportunity that you don't even know about um, because everyone there wants to help you and everyone there wants to create something. So I didn't even know that there were opportunities within the athletic department until um, it was later in my journey at Belmont. And I was a, a junior senior when I first started to get involved. And there was actually somebody else who wanted to do something similar. And so um, I was kind of coming in last minute and um, was willing to take anything. I mean, from doing talent stats where I sit next to the play-by-play -play person to sitting back mm -hmm. in the truck to keeping score in what can only be described as a dungeon underneath <laughs> in the back of the gym. <laughs> I see some head shaking yeah. here. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, it was just, there's so many opportunities, but you just got to ask. And that's what's really cool is no one will ever turn you away. If anything, they'll say, well, okay, I'll find something for you to do. I've seen people hold courts <laughs> for people shooting games. I mean, even if there's not anything as, as glamorous as being on TV or being a huge part of the broadcast, they will find something for you to do. And that's what makes Belmont so special is there is so much opportunity. Sure, it's not a perennial power like a Mizzou or a Northwestern or Syracuse or anything like that as far as being known for journalism. But that almost makes it a kind of hidden gem is that you're not competing yeah. with a ton of people that want to do the same thing as you. It's, it's, it's what you make it. Um, mm -hmm. And as I mentioned the studio earlier, um, the studio that we used was something I literally had to dust off. Uh, it shot in four by three, which is the old form shooting. Everything was like a square and it didn't look good. And I didn't use anything for my <laughs> reel, but just getting the reps um, and, and getting mm -hmm. to actually communicate with people that used to do what you do. Um, there's people in the, in the athletic department that have worked in local news. There's um, one of my old professors actually was a writer for the Tennessean. And so getting to hear what it's actually like to be a journalist um, is mm -hmm. was such a valuable experience and just the mm -hmm. massive opportunities that are available all across campus, really. For sure. And like you said, um, being involved in any way you can, especially, I mean, with any line of work too, I feel like you always need to just, just because you want to be in one certain 
area of an industry doesn't mean that you can't branch out or start somewhere else. And I think that's such an important thing to remember when, especially being someone like me or like a post-grad, like just knowing that you're not going to get your dream job, you know, like six months after you graduate. So starting, you know, maybe small and just working your way up there is definitely something that I've learned from Christian and um, everybody in the athletic department and just from you too. It's such an important thing to remember. In it just needs to be a mindset, I think too, is that no job is, is too big and you'll come across as that person too, that's not too good for something or won't do this because it's this team. You know, I, I wasn't able to do the, the prize jewel of, of men's basketball when I was in school, but I did some volleyball. I did softball. Yeah. You know, I was just like, yep. give me whatever you can do. Uh, I'll do it. And, and that mm-hmm. needs to be, I think, a, a good mindset to have, just take with you in life. Cause yeah, you're not going to get the dream job right out of college. Um, mm-hmm. But even if you think that it is the dream job, you still got to have that mindset of I'm, I'm still going to grind. I'm going to be that person that's willing to do anything. Um, and that's just always a, a good, good thing to remember in life. <laughs> right. And it's, I feel like it's all about experience too. Like, I bet you can mm-hmm. relate to this too with soccer. I mean, growing up for me with golf, I wasn't great my first three years, but I played with people that were really good. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's really what kind of set me up to the next level in golf and um in career paths too is just you got to be around people that do it and you have to experience different aspects of the sport or of the career and then that's how you can catapult into you know what you want to do and it might be something that you don't think you would ever like to do because coming into Belmont I didn't know I wanted to pursue something in you know sports (laughs) media but sophomore year I was like I'm gonna give it a try and if I hate it I hate it but at least I tried it and at least I got to experience that so and at least you learned you know at at the very least I always say you know take take every single job um be be super eager and at the very least you will learn okay I do not like that (laughs) but at least you can cross that off your list and then you don't go back to that but you've still learned something so it's still valuable Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that crossing it off is almost bigger than keeping it on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have less options. You're like, well, I, it's in between these two. So at least it's going to be one of those rather than one of these five, you know? Exactly. <laughs> so what is it? I mean, what's it like being on camera every day? I mean, you are on camera every day, correct? Basically. Yeah, no, it's terrifying still. Um, <laughs> my favorite thing is I was an intern in Knoxville and there was a guy that had been there, I mean, nearly 40 years. And I asked him because I would always just get so nervous. I said, does it get easier? And he said, no. And at first I was so upset at that answer. I was like, well, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, mm. But he explained a little bit, you know, it, it kind of, it keeps you on your toes. Um, it keeps it fun too. I don't know about you, but something being super easy and, and not challenging at all is not really fun. Um, cause you just kind of coast through it. You don't feel like you're getting better. You don't feel like you're challenging yourself. And so I, at first I didn't like that advice because I thought that, you know, there was that one point in your career where you're supposed to like get to the, the top and be like, okay, I'm hundred percent. I'm good to go. I don't have to try anymore. No, um, that's not how life works. And that's definitely not how this career works. And so it's, it's still kind of strange. And I still absolutely hate watching myself, hate hearing myself. Oh, um, I'm, sure this is a, I'm sure this is a great program that you guys do, but it will be cringy for me to listen back because I absolutely hate, hate hearing it. Um, and it's, it's just so funny how, um, how much I've changed too from when I was um, doing some Bruin Blitz that have been all completely erased from the internet, hopefully, um, back when Ooh. I was a Belmont student. <laughs> Fingers crossed those are all gone yeah, so um, because it is, it is so cringy, um, but it's, it's such a liberating experience. I swear when I get off air at 1030 at night, people think, okay, well, you're done at 1030, drive home, get ready for bed, go to bed. No, I am wired (laughs) because it takes energy to be on camera and I can't just turn it off and go right to bed. It's like, it's like coffee. Um, So it's, it's very difficult to turn it off, but it is kind of like a a buzz for sure. I mean, it's terrifyingly fun is probably how I would phrase it. (laughs) Well, that's very, I mean, it's promising advice, but also kind of (laughs) kind of scary at the same time like you said but I mean I get that to a to a degree like before I came on this podcast like five minutes before I clicked the zoom link I was 
you know, kind of my face is getting a little red. I was kind of nervous. So I'm about to lead like these questions and talk to even this person. But it's like you said, it's a thrill. And I think turning that nervous energy into, you know, positive energy and just almost thriving off of it and like, you know, getting off of it, it makes your work so much better, easier. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. And it's it's good to kind of be on your toes, too. Um, you never want to feel mm -hmm. too comfortable or else it kind of comes off on camera, too. It's like, oh, this person's mm -hmm. not even trying that hard. Um, so mm -hmm. it's good to, to mm -hmm. be, you know, on edge a little bit, but in, in a yeah. fun way. And that's what I think I would I would have said if I was this old man trying to give a young, you know, excited journalist some advice is it doesn't necessarily get easier, but it definitely gets more fun. Um, because when you know you nail it and then you get off air and you're like, you know, nothing feels better than that. You just, you just want to yeah. punch into the yeah. air because I keep doing for whatever reason, but it is, it's so fun. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a thrill for sure. Um, and it's something that, that does get more fun, but as far as the nerves completely going away, they never do. And that's good. That means you care. Yeah. And that's awesome. I love to hear how passionate you are about your work and just how your example you gave, you know, whenever you get off air at 1030, you can't go to sleep till you know midnight or something because it's just all the adrenaline running and um I feel like it's the same thing on stage my dad would play late gigs some nights and he'd come back and he'd be exhausted I'm like well just go to sleep and he's like I can't do that like you know I just feel you know I you feel the lights you feel the camera you know you feel it you can't just you know go to sleep and be like okay did that next bye you know like it's just because it takes a lot too and you put a lot of effort you know if I was just yeah, kind of rolling exactly. out of bed going on air and then going back to bed my on air stuff probably wouldn't look that great <laughs> yeah no so this is this is good then <laughs> yes. um so with COVID and sports obviously that didn't happen for a good like five months what did you do to make reports I mean what did you do to fill in that time where there was nothing to really report on? A lot of desperation, uh, a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, a lot of just trying to find something um, to talk about. And I think what it kind of, you know, reminded all of us is we are sports journalists, um, which doesn't mean that we necessarily just cover sports. Um, There's so many stories that come with sports. And that's why I wanted to be a sports feature writer is because I just thought athletes were the most interesting human beings ever. And I think a lot of people think that... <laughs> Not, I'm not saying me, but you know, just yeah. <laughs> these high profile oh, athletes are very interesting yeah. people. Um, <laughs> but just yeah. in, in general, I mean, I think that a lot of people think, you know, when sports shut down, there's nothing to do. I had family members saying like, are you going to keep your job? And I'm like, I don't know. Nobody knows right now. Thanks a lot, aunt. Um, but in the grand scheme <laughs> of things, like there was always something to report on because you were going from mm -hmm. sports shutting down. That is the biggest story ever. Mm -hmm. I, w I remember I was walking to Bridgestone Arena. I lived like just a few blocks away and I was going to cover the SEC tournament and I was walking in and I just seen on my phone that it was canceled. It was on Thursday when they officially mm -hmm. canceled it. And I walk in and I try to get my credential and the woman goes, oh, did you hear it was canceled? I said, yeah, that's a big story. <laughs> like, let yeah. me in. <laughs> like, I, that's a massive <laughs> story. They just canceled yeah. the SEC tournament. So, you know, it's not just about covering basketball it's about covering the spectacle mm -hmm. that is okay this is canceled this is absolutely unprecedented but you know what's just around the corner the ncaa tournament what's the future of that and so there's always been so many stories and then there was kind of the um fallback from all of it as well is you know you have these heart-wrenching stories of seniors that never had their senior night of guys that had unfinished business because they qualified for the NCAA tournament but didn't get to go you know live out their dream of playing in, in a postseason tournament and then there were people whose careers just ended like that and so there was so much heartbreak that came out of it and so I I spoke with everyone from you know physical therapists um, to talk about what what is this going to be like from a break on their muscles or there going to be more injuries when we come back I talked to actual therapists about, you know, kind of the mindset of what it's like from this is your entire world to just somebody taking it away from you and not getting to have that closure of that senior night or saying goodbye or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, because I was, you know, more concerned, honestly, with these high school athletes, because only 2% go on to play um, college sports. And so I, I know that you dedicate your entire life to something, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you get to go on and play at the next level. And so that was just it for them. 
And, and that's also a big escape for a lot of people too, if they're dealing with stuff in their personal life, but they, they would always have that sports escape. And so you, there were so many stories that come out of it. And then by the time we kind of exhausted all the really sad stories, it was like, all right, how are we going to get sports back? What are we, what's yeah. this bubble situation going to be like? How are we going to, you know, bring student athletes back on campus to practice? We can't bring students on campus to, uh, to be students over the summer. And so there was a lot a lot to talk about because I think people think when when the sports world stopped and when everything was paused it was like well, what do we do now there was so much to cover and so much to talk about and it challenged you of course you know you have to be more creative um because it's so much easier to just wake up roll out of bed turn on the Mike Rabel <laughs> zoom call and then you've got your Titan yep. stories for the day yeah um so yep. you have to do a little bit of digging and a little bit of creativity but there was an endless supply of stories for sure that's awesome. And thinking about what you just said, just going to talk to therapists and different, um, you know, people of team, of team sports and the high school people and the coaches, like that just goes to show you how much is actually put into this job and, you know, um, this career path, because I bet just people think, oh, she just, you know, wakes up and talks about what's going on in sports. And uh, this might not, this might be like, they trust you, but there's so much more that goes into it in the behind the scenes rather than what you actually say for those, I don't know, 15, 20 <laughs> minutes. And yeah. that's awesome. I mean, it's just so much more than people think. Yeah. I mean, I like to say that it's, you know, us being on air is like the iceberg. Um, it's just the, the small little part that you see. It's maybe 90 seconds at six o'clock, two minutes at 10 o'clock. Um, but a lot of it's kind of built up from, from behind the scenes. And um, I think what was so great about that time is that you know, you kind of just had to sit there with yourself and ask a bunch of questions, like, how does this affect this person? How does it affect this person or this team or whatever? And so you, ultimately your job is, is a storyteller. Everything, even the people that are so in the weeds when it comes to stats, they're trying to tell a story with stats. So ultimately the number one thing that you got to bring with you is your storytelling ability because that'll always be with you no matter what you do. Uh, if you do a post-game wrap of a uh, game, you're telling the story of the game. And so, so much of it is just having kind of that um, mindset that everything is a story. I mean, I remember I did a interview with Jalil Anibaba, who's a, a player for Nashville SC. I remember he said one time that he could cut his own hair and he cut, <laughs> he cut hair for all of his teammates when they were at training camp in February. And so I was thinking about, everybody was talking about, oh my gosh, where am I going to get my hair cut during quarantine when mm -hmm. everything was shut down? I was like, oh, I'll talk to Jalil about, you know, maybe he can give us some advice for some at-home haircuts. And so it's just, I mean, it's random stuff like that where you just kind of yeah. have to, you know, keep things in the back of your mind of the, the thing about the pandemic is one, it affected everything and two, it affected everyone. So the stories were just endless and you had to just kind of think about them and think about how they affected you in particular. I mean, I, I talked to Belmont strength and conditioning coach about how he was getting everybody ready to go over the summer, mm -hmm. you know, creative things like sticking some um, books in your backpack and doing squats. And because I was seeing people on Instagram and on Twitter, like curling yeah, milk jugs. Exactly. Um, oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, I wonder what actual athletes are doing if they don't have gym mm -hmm. equipment at home. And so it's just kind of, you know, putting yourself in into the story a little bit and thinking of how would this affect me oh maybe this is also mm -hmm. affecting this guy mm -hmm. um so mm -hmm. there was endless endless supply of stories yeah i love that um kind of saying that sports media is like do your storytelling and it's just like basically telling your why and christian told me that and it's never like left my brain that it's just <laughs> storytelling it's basically and you're just talking about you know what's going on you know, and I, uh, ever since you said that, it's just stuck in my brain so much. So I have one last question for you, though, and it is somewhat related. Um, do you miss Belmont? I mean, what is the thing that you miss the most about Belmont? Because I know that Christian still talks about you and you're still talked about. So what is the thing that you miss the most about Belmont? I'm not gonna lie, it's hard to miss Belmont. I'm pretty sure I can see it from my window out here. Um, I still go back and work at Belmont. I talked to a Belmont alum today, Matt Beatty, who just won the World Series. So I feel very connected to Belmont mm -hmm. still. Um, gosh, I miss college in general. I mean, having, having that structure and uh, worrying about all the adult things. 
um, that you have to worry about, but I miss the people more than anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have just never felt a community like I've felt at Belmont. I mean, from people in the athletic department, to people in the journalism department to, um, I mean, just everything. I, I'm still so close with so many people there. Um, not just classmates. I think that's kind of the common misconception is you go to college and you make a bunch of friends and you got a bunch of classmates. Yeah. But there are so many people there that are just there for you and are there to help you. Um, and it's such a like transformative time that I don't know if maybe that impacts you more is that they're not just kind of helping yeah, you. I would agree. You know, be happy. They're they're helping you with your life. <laughs> it's it's yeah. huge, huge things. Um, and and so many things can kind of change the trajectory of your life too. And so I. I miss just the people there. I, I never mm -hmm. thought that that's what the experience in college would be like. I'm like, I'm ready mm -hmm. to go get some friends. I'm ready to go have fun. <laughs> yeah. I'm ready to play soccer. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I got so close with so many just straight up like adults. <laughs> I'm an yeah. adult, I guess yeah. now, but I'm thinking of like yeah. professors yeah. and mentors and stuff like that. Um, it's just, I mean, Belmont, I like, you know, we all think it's one of a kind, but I really, I really think it is. No, I really it, think it, it really is. is. You're right. And I think everybody, <laughs> think that same thing I mean I have felt that same way they just the people and like you said even the professors and faculty and staff that you wouldn't think transform your life they do and they're I feel like at Belmont they're honestly there to make you have your best life and for you oh, and you might not realize it while you're at Belmont that's the thing is you're you leave <laughs> yeah. and like two years yes. later you go oh my gosh Doran Robinson told me this and it is so true yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't hit you until yeah. maybe a few years later and then you realize yeah. just how unique it is and you you make friends in the workforce and you ask them what their college experiences mm -hmm. are like and it's not it's not like mm -hmm. that they don't remember who was their English professor they don't remember I mean mm -hmm. I still follow everybody on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dr. Sib is, is a wonderful follow <laughs> if you don't follow her. But yeah, I mean, there's just, there's so many people that um, mean a lot to you while you're there. And then you just, you hear the voice in their head every year that you're gone. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's something to look forward to, I think. <laughs> in a good way, in a good way. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, yes. Well, Emily, thank you so much again for joining this podcast and for just talking to me. And hopefully our viewers learned a little bit more about you and just the sports reporting, media, storytelling, broadcasting world. Um, hopefully you guys will join us after our break where Emma Kate Lou joins us to talk about what she's been up to since May of 2019 and just to catch up with a dear friend. We have Emma Kate Liu, who is a Belmont Women's Golf alum. She is currently a labor and delivery nurse in Dallas, Texas, and one of my dear friends. I got to spend one glorious year with Emma, and she is such a light in my life, especially through my spiritual life. The fellowship and community that we have through the Lord is so special, and I've seen God through Emma Kate in so many different ways. So Emma, thank you so much for joining us today. So good to see you. So good to be back in my Belmont bubble for a second. I know, we miss you, we miss you. So uh, talk to us a little bit about what you've been up to since May of 2019. <laughs> no, it's been crazy. So um, I pretty much started working, I think three weeks after I graduated from Belmont, so there wasn't much of a rest, but I have been a labor and delivery nurse in downtown Dallas at Baylor University Medical Center um, since then, and it's been a joy and privilege to get to just welcome sweet life into the world um, since, yeah, since I graduated. It's been so much fun. Um, COVID has definitely 
made being a nurse even more challenging. Never thought I'd be like battling a pandemic in my first year of nursing, but mm -hmm. here we are. And um, I think it's going to be, we're going to be stronger for it, but it's really been like an incredible experience to get to do what I do every week. So that's awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for just what you've been doing in the hospitals and truly being like a uh, hero throughout this time. I know you've probably heard that so much, but it's so true, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so you've told me and many other people, well, this is just your position, but you work night shifts. So how different is that coming from, you know, you. the student athlete life of waking yeah. up at 6 a.m. and then staying up these crazy hours, especially with nursing school. So what was that transition like? And are you used to it now? Yeah, that's, those are great <laughs> questions. I, so I guess I went to bed at like 930 most nights in college and got up at 530. <laughs> um, just being a nursing student and a golfer just required a pretty strict grandma schedule as I called it. But um, yeah, now I'm completely flopped, which I never thought I would be so nocturnal. But um, I just got off of work like an hour ago and I'll probably go to bed as soon as as soon as we're done chatting. But um, it is weird. I sleep from about like 8.30 to 4.30 um, p.m. <laughs> and wake up and eat breakfast at five. So um, that's been, it was a pretty tough adjustment at first. I think I'm kind of used to it now. Um, yeah, I guess it's kind of rewarding to come home and know that at like two o'clock in the morning, I helped a family welcome in their baby girl or baby boy. Um, yeah. so I always leave feeling like really fulfilled and rewarded for what I get to do, which is really sweet. You are truly living the dream, your dream at least. Huh? I truly am. <laughs> Yeah, that's so that's so awesome. I bet you're gonna have to use those blackout curtains a lot because the, yes. the, the sun comes through your window. Mm -hmm. just, oh, good, good. I'm so glad because I sometimes I feel like I need them, but I yeah. know they are perfect so use cool. for you as a nocturnal nurse, as you could say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, sure. So just with this year of difficulties and uncertainties, especially in a hospital, what I mean, how have you seen God through this year? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's a really loaded question. I feel like I could yeah. probably answer that one in, you know, a couple of hours. But mm -hmm. um, I think I've mainly seen the Lord just move ultimately in my own heart and just having to trust him and um, trust how he's working through this weird random virus that's come through. Uh, there's just a lot of days where I'm really sick and tired of having to um, gown up and take it all off again and gown up again, um, mm -hmm. and wear all the gear and, um, have to explain rules and regulations and explain why we have them. And, um, my heart mainly hurts for my patients because, um, grandparents aren't allowed to come see their baby, mm -hmm. and new, new granddaughter, or grandson, and siblings can't come up to the hospital and see their new baby brother or sister. And so the, the whole birth experience has just been so different um, from what it looked like pre-COVID-19. Um, and so I really just felt, um, I don't call it a burden. It's not a burden at all, but I, I've just felt the extra push to make um, the labor and delivery experience extra special because it is lacking a lot of just sweet family time and other memories that um, may have come before the whole COVID experience, but, um, the Lord has just totally revealed to me that none of this is in our control. Um, no matter what medicine, vaccines, um, rules, masking, not masking, um, <laughs> you know, just anything that we try and do, it's just hilarious how I think as, as man, we try and control so much and have the answers for so much. Mm. But I think we've just seen through this whole thing that we know so little and we understand so little and um, that truly that this is just a time to surrender to the Lord um, and to trust in his plan because it's really easy to try and sit there and manipulate a situation to try and not spread this thing um, as best we can. But ultimately, like, I know that God's sovereign and that's been the most... Mm. Um, that's been the thing that I've just been clinging to is my hope is that he's sovereign. Um, none of this is a surprise to him. 
Um, he saw it coming way before we did. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's what I, that's what I rest in at the end of the day. Yeah. And I think that you hit it on the nail earlier, whenever you said that you're just trusting in him. And I think that that is such an important thing to remember for everybody in this world right now. Like that is the only thing we have because nothing right now is in our control. And, you know, it's diff it was difficult in the beginning of COVID and everything and quarantine to trust and find, you know, comfort and peace. But I think that like, as this is progressing gone on, that finding comfort and peace through trusting him and knowing that this is all part of his plan, everything that we're going through personal lives, like then just the difficulties and trying times of COVID, like finding comfort and peace through that is so important. And I mean, I know that probably going through like the labor and delivery process, like you just wanna make this experience for those mothers and fathers just as wonderful as it can be and just try and just, you know, make it as good as we can and just like, just really enjoy the experience as much as possible, so. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I know they do too. Oh. So I only got one year with you, but mm -hmm. I really did look up to you and your love for God was just infectious. I think that everybody who meets you just, just can say probably the same thing. We were talking earlier about how you're so rememberable and oh. I'm so happy that I got to interview you and talk to you right now because, you know, sometimes whenever I go through situations you know now that I'm sort of like an upperclassman I'm like well, huh, what would Emma Kate do what Emma Kate kind of like you know like be oh, stern no. or would she you know you know not you know and so I'm like okay like this is kind of what she would do I don't know like I just try and That's follow so your path because it's just so just you were just such a sweet soul on Belmont's campus and um, but I know it's not always easy you know being a college athlete and like you experienced some of that too and everybody does so what encouragement could you give to a college student college student athlete somebody experiencing the some of the last four years that they're in school going yeah. through so many changes and ups and downs yeah absolutely um I I always talk about this with my coworkers or just different people um about golf ex my golf experience or it'll just kind of come up in conversation about my golf experience or um I don't really advertise it but sometimes people will just be like you play golf in college and it's hilarious um how many of the you know different doctors that love to play golf will um just chat my ear off about it all the time but mm -hmm. I think one of the most like encouraging pieces of advice I could have for anyone that's um a college athlete right now is that the Lord is using your sport to mold you and shape you and um, refine you in more ways than you could ever imagine. I didn't realize how much golf was going to prepare me, um, how much college golf, my time at Belmont, um, everything that Belmont was, how much that prepared me for the real world. There are so many instances in my day where I, um, I literally think about how uh, my routine in being a student athlete prepared me for a certain moment in a certain emergency situation in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I thank the Lord for that because only he could have known that. And only he could have seen that um, the experiences that I had as a collegiate athlete would eventually make me into a better nurse and a better follower of Jesus. And so uh, there were many moments in my college experience where I I really didn't want to keep playing my sport. Um, but like, honestly, I think we all have days where we wake up and don't want to keep doing it, but I'm so glad that I did. It paid off. And I think the Lord used golf to, um, a like reveal my character, um, to myself and to see like where I was um, lacking, but to also just build the character that I needed, um, to build integrity and to build, um, wisdom and, and patience and kindness into me. Um, cause there were a lot of things in college that I think I just, I grew in. And uh, one of those things was my walk with Jesus. And that was definitely because of 
um, Coach Bradford and FCA and Mm -hmm. just the whole Belmont athletic department. And so, yeah, my biggest piece of advice is just to remember that what you're doing is not, um, it's not without meaning it's going to pay off eventually too, especially during COVID. I feel like that would be a really, really, really hard year to be a golfer and to be a student athlete in general, when you just don't know what your season's going to look like. But Mm -hmm. um, I know that for sure. I can, I can say today, there are so many moments where I come into work and have a situation and it's literally like trying to pick a golf club out of my bag or (laughs) trying to figure out (laughs) what I would like assessing the situation. Yeah. (laughs) What club you would hit. Literally. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think that I'm guilty of this too, but I think that so many times athletes just get so in their head about their sport and that their sport is very separate from their life. But in reality, so many of those lessons you learn on the field, on the course, on the court can be applied in real life. And like you just explained to us, like some of the things you learned through golf and through college golf, you're applying in your you know, job field right now. And so I think that that's really important, and especially through golf, like not to brag on golf, but I think that you just learn so oh, yeah. much oh, yeah. in that sport. You know, yeah. it's a very individualistic sport but you are out there, you know, forced to play with two other girls. And when, what are you going to do whenever you're out there for four hours? Like, are you just going to, you know, not talk or are you going to try and make those connections, you know, make friendships and, you know, see them five years down the road, you know, it's, I mean, at the end of the day, you're not going to remember really what you shot that one day. You're going to remember those people you met, those people you impacted and um, how they impacted you. And that's something that I always try and remember um, for sure. So, well, how is your golf game? Speaking of that, (laughs) have you been playing any? I have, I mean, not as much as I would like to, but um, I played probably a month ago or so, maybe less than, Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think I shot 79. Like I'm not crumbling. Nice. (laughs) Like playing (laughs) the best, I, you know, but um, (laughs) Yeah, I think the key is just having fun and staying laid back. Um, I love that advice. The time. I love playing with my dad. Um, so as funny. soon as I graduated last fall, my dad took me to Pebble Beach to go play um, out there. And that was mm-hmm. the best golf experience I have ever had. Oh, so, I can only imagine. Yeah, I kind of got the golf bug again after I, I played there. And wanted to well, that's good to know that it still exists oh, yeah. after your, your competition. I didn't throw them away. They're, my clubs are still in the car. So. <laughs> good, good. Pebble Beach is my like number one. I want to play there yeah. so bad. So I am very jealous. I think I, I. What did you shoot on those days? Am I telling you? Um, I you shot pretty well. You no, know, I shot seventy six the first day, and then I set the bar really too high for myself (laughs) (laughs) you I would never imagine and then then it went downhill from there I played spyglass the next day and shot 80 and then we played pebble the third day and I shot I think I shot 82 so that's three those are three (laughs) long days of golf so I mean I don't blame you for a retired athlete for a retired college athlete I'll take it right so good to hear that almost two years after you know post-grad you're still loving the sport and loving golf that is that's very promising (laughs) because you know I don't know if you felt like this but sometimes athletes are like I am just after I play competitively it is just like I don't know how I can ever have fun and sometimes I feel like that too you know whenever I am playing I'm like I don't know how to have fun like even whenever i I'm right. just playing with my dad and friends I'm like I'm, I feel like I'm just so competitive because you know how good you can be and so whenever you're just out there you know whacking the ball with some friends it's yeah. hard to really enjoy yeah. it if it's not yeah you know to your standards yeah so but you know it, it happens golf is so different every day it so yeah. and that's something you always got to remember totally. so uh, Emma Kate, it was so good to hear from you yeah. and talk to you. I'm gonna let you go, you know, take your oh no, daily you're good. sleep. It's just <laughs> such an honor to be able to come back and chat with, with you. So 
Thanks, Pat. Well, we all miss you, the Belmont staff, Belmont Athletics, all the student athletes I know miss you, and I do too. So thank you so much for what you're doing in the hospital. Again, you're a hero, and you know we look up to you and just pray that God can you, continues to bless your life in the hospital and on the course. Hey, I, I would love to play around with you coming up soon. That'd oh, be so yeah. fun. That would, oh, I would totally be down. You know, once this COVID thing's over, I I gotta I gotta tee it up with you. Yes, I'm. I yeah, I'll be in Nashville soon. I'm sure. I want to meet y'all's new coach too. She seems super cool. Oh, she's awesome. Yeah, she's a a big blessing. So we're really excited about her. Thank you again, Emma Kate, for coming on and chatting with me, and for just again all you're doing in the hospital. You're a hero, and we really appreciate you. And continue to pray blessings upon your life. Thank you. Thank you again to my guests, John, Emily, and Emma Kate. It was so good to catch up with them, and hopefully, you guys learned a little bit more about them just as I did. Once again, I have loved being the host for this week's episode of the Bruin Show podcast. Hopefully, you enjoyed seeing me for a second week in a row. It was fun for me, at least. And we'll see you next time. Bye.